Great. So um, I'm very glad to be able to welcome Greg Croft. Um, he's going to talk to us about the theory of plate tectonics and continental drift. Uh, Greg is a petroleum consultant and a lecturer in environmental and earth sciences at St. Mary's College. Um, he's educated at uh, Cal Berkeley, Stanford, UCSB, and the, the Hard Knock School of Life. And um, so anyway, we're very uh, glad to have you, Greg, and um, it's all yours. Okay. Let me uh, go to the screen sharing mode here. Am I... Uh... Oops, what's happening? Okay, so everybody can uh, see my slides now, I hope. Mm -hmm. So this talk, it's called Plate Tectonics of Revolution in Earth Science. And uh, it, as uh, came out in the introduction there, the uh, each science kind of has a big revolution at some point. It happened in the 19th century in biology with evolution and in chemistry with the development of the periodic table, the elements, and then later with the understanding of the structure of the atom and what, what drove all that. Physics has had a couple with, with uh, relativity and also with quantum theory. And this was a big upheaval in earth sciences. And it's more recent than all those other ones I listed. And so a lot of the people involved in it are still alive. And for me, uh, my education was started in the 1970s college education. And so it was already widely accepted at that point, but it, it went through a big hurdle of acceptance. And so I'm going to divide my talk into three parts, and in between the parts, I'll take breaks for questions. The first part, I'm going to talk about the history of plate tectonics. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory itself and um, you know, the various components of it. And then I'm going to talk about research topics and, and sort of further developments in it for the third part. So going with the history, uh, it really got launched in 1915. A uh, German meteorologist and geologist named Alfred Wegener uh, published a book on origins of oceans and continents. And he hypothesized a supercontinent, which he called Pangea, that broke up into the present day continents. And he had a lot of evidence. Uh, he looked at the fit of the continents. I'm gonna look at each of these pieces of evidence. He talked about locations of ancient glaciations, distribution of fossil organisms, rock types and structural similarities across the uh, climate, and also climate evidence in the rocks indicated that at the time they were deposited, they're different latitude from what they are today. And uh, Wegener's idea got enough prominence that it, it did get debated, but he was largely ridiculed and, and plate tectonics did not have a following in his time. And the breakdown, he died in 1930 at the age of 40, the breakdown was almost all the people that believed in plate tectonics or geologists who believed in plate tectonics before the Second World War worked in the Southern Hemisphere. Turns out there's a lot better evidence for it in the Southern Hemisphere. But the drift hypothesis faded without Wegener's energy and everything. And then it came back in a big way in the uh, 1950s and actually a whole period of time from the end of the Second World War until the uh, mid 1960s was sort of the, the time of the big revolution. We had a lot of new data and a lot of supporting evidence. So looking at the, the different components of Wagner's argument, uh, he noticed that the continents seemed to fit together. Uh, he argued the fit couldn't be accidental. And of course, present day shorelines, which is a lot of what he had worked with make a rough fit. But when we talk about you know, modern maps, even if you look at Google Maps, it shows you bathymetry in the oceans. And the average depth of the oceans is really great. It's about 13,000 feet. But a lot of the continents have a little shelf around them that's typically zero to 600 foot depth. If you look at that shelf edge, that makes a better fit. And then we'll talk, as we go on, we'll talk about the reasons why. So other one was glacial evidence. Uh, it turns out there's not a lot of glacial material in the geologic record. The uh, most of Earth history, including the entire uh, three periods where dinosaurs were running around, there were no glaciers at all. Uh, so glaciers only occur at certain times in the geologic record and then in certain places. But we find it from the Permian period. So this is a time of 
say 200, 250, or between 275, 250 million years ago. Uh, and we find these glacial deposits in South America, Africa, India, and Australia, all from that time period. And uh, the, at least the ones in Africa and India are pretty close to the equator now. And so was the, we can ask, was the earth a lot colder in Permian times? And the answer is no, you see a lot of tropical plants and other things. Nowadays, we look at oxygen isotopes, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, to estimate ancient temperatures. We figure the Permian period was most of the time warmer than today, but you still had a, a big ice cap on this southern supercontinent. And as we reconstruct it, like the inset image here, with Wegener's reconstruction, it comes out as one ice sheet with a radial flow pattern. The directions of ancient glaciers can be interpreted based on the uh, scoring of the rocks underneath them. And then the other thing, well, if we moved our continents around uh, to where Wegener put them together uh, in Permian time, it showed what should, the areas that should be in the tropics in Permian time had coals and other warm weather plant deposits, have coral reefs, which are normally only found in warm water, uh, large scale ones. We have subtropical deserts in a band outside of the tropics, similar to what we observe today. And that same latitude band that has deserts, we have what we call evaporites. These are deposits of salts, usually from um, salt lakes. This is sort of thing you could see in Nevada or Utah today. And so these are associated usually with warm, dry climates. Uh, so we had a lot of good paleoclimate evidence to support this. And then we have fossil evidence. Uh, we have different creatures. The blue dots show this Mesosaurus was a swimming reptile. And this is long enough ago. The Permian is before the first dinosaurs evolved. Uh, we also have some sort of squat land-dwelling reptiles. We see Lystrosaurus and uh, Synognathus. And uh, the latter was actually an ancestor of today's mammals. And these are found across different continents. And no possibility that a creature like this could swim across an ocean. And then we found a seed fern with heavy seeds. So it wouldn't have blown across oceans. And at this time period, birds hadn't evolved yet. So you cannot infer that birds could have spread these plants. So if we look at the list of the fossil evidence, we say we have a freshwater reptile. Turns out we now know we have an ancient lake deposit. And it was a single lake that split between Southern Africa and South America. And then I'd say a plant with heavy seeds at a time with no birds, some land-dwelling sort of squat reptiles. None of these could have crossed an ocean. Another piece of evidence Vagan are pointed to is that the geologic phenomenon, and continents tend to be structured, the green blobs shown here are extremely old areas referred to as shields. And then the uh, mountain belts, ancient mountain belts, uh, line up if you put together uh, South America and Africa. So, and then it turns out also within these, these uh, areas shown as green there, these Archaean areas, Archean is the very earliest part of Earth history. We also see similar rock types and ages across these boundaries. And so, and we see this also in the North Atlantic. Um, it turns out the Atlas Mountains of Morocco are kind of an extension of the Appalachian Mountains of the United States. And the, the uh, Caledonian Mountains of uh, the British Isles are also an extension of that. Uh, so we see these uh, combinations matching across there. So it was actually a pretty good body of evidence put together by someone, you know, an early time in, in development of science. So you have to ask, why wasn't it accepted? And the big group of people who did not accept it before the Second World War were geophysicists, because it was, they explained there was no way you could push, and these continents are is like an eggshell, is very thin relative to its area, that you could push this thing edgewise through solid rock. And so the absence of a mechanism of how it could work uh, caused people to be opposed to it. And so when Wegener died, the debate kind of died with him. And now come the second part of the, uh, the sort of history. Big change happens with the Second World War. Uh, one of the things you learn when you study science is that wars, while they're terrible in lots of other ways, are often good for science. Uh, we developed seismometers in the First World War, and in the Second World War, we learned about the oceans. So one of the things they developed, uh, submarine warfare was actually important in both world wars. And so they developed the sonar, reflects sound waves off the bottom, 
but you could map the ocean floor. And when they started actually making global maps of the ocean floor, and there was a big push to do this in the United States after the war, because with nuclear weapons and nuclear submarines, there was a question, so how do you navigate a nuclear submarine? You know, well, you're, if there's a nuclear, you know, the whole idea was that so the other side was gonna do a nuclear first strike, and then you were gonna be able to fire back with your submarines. But if they've already been a nuclear strike, you have no way to navigate the submarines. Everything up in the atmosphere, you're gonna have intense radiation and everything. So the way it was originally done was they mapped the bottom and the submarine was literally finding itself on a map, just like a backpacker on a topographic map. And so the, the Navy went and mapped the bottom of all the world's oceans. And so that was a big project. And people discovered a whole bunch of things in the oceans. And one of them is that they have these mountain ranges, ridge systems running up the middle of them. And that the deepest parts of the oceans were not in the middle like a lake. They were usually, they were near either near continents or near strings of islands. So the shape of the ocean was, was quite different from what people expected. But as we're going to see, this fits in quite well with our theory of plate tectonics. But this information didn't really exist except on a local scale, but it exists on a global scale until after the Second World War. The other thing that happened after the Second World War is we got a much better worldwide system of seismometers so we could actually track and accurately locate the positions of earthquakes, including earthquakes that happened offshore. And we found that these earthquakes were in belts. And of course, we now know that these belts of earthquakes represent the boundaries between these plates. But just these are, gave us that much more evidence supporting this theory of te plate tectonics. And so it was a really rapid growth, a lot of very good articles uh, published after the Second World War in the 1950s, a paper by Vine and Matthews uh, argued for seafloor spreading. And then the one that kind of pulled it all together, uh, Harry Hess was a professor at Princeton, and he published uh, what he called his essay in geopoetry because he combined the idea of the seafloor spreading with the idea that in the trenches, this crust was driving back down into the mantle. When people talked about seafloor spreading in isolation, you had to ask, why would the seafloor spread if the uh, Earth is staying the same size? But if we can have the, the crust disappearing at the trenches and appearing at these, uh, at the, on the seafloor, then we can have this ongoing process without having the uh, Earth change in size. And it also starts developing some possibilities for mechanism to make this thing work. And so by combining these things, uh, Hess neither invented the idea the crust going down, nor to invent the idea of seafloor spreading, but he pulled it all together into this grand synthesis. And so that was kind of the beginning of us really understanding it. And then another piece of evidence that showed up in the post-war year, of course, uh, let's say submarine warfare was important in the Second World War. And the way you look for submarines was with a magnetometer towed behind an airplane. Then the war comes to an end. You have all these surplus magnetometers. So all these universities pick them up. And uh, within a short period of time, you start having magnetic maps all over the world. Uh, so when we look at magnetic reversals, by, by this time, by the post-war period, we can do radioactive age dating of rocks. And uh, so if we have igneous rocks that cooled from a melt, we can date the time when it cooled. And the Earth's magnetic field uh, over period every several hundred thousand years reverses. And this reversal is recorded in the igneous rocks because as this hot rock cools, uh, little tiny crystals of magnetic minerals, so this would be magnetite, ilmenite, line up in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And of course, there's sort of two possibilities. There's the present orientation, or there's what we refer to as reversed, because it's the opposite of the present orientation. Well, if that gets trapped in the seafloor, what that's going to do is if we're measuring the magnetic field over an area where the rock cooled when the magnetic field was reversed, the present day magnetic field is gonna be slightly less because it's pictured sort of like a bar magnet in the opposite direction of the Earth's present magnetic field. And there's a the magnetism of this is orders of magnitude smaller than the Earth's magnetic field. So you need an accurate magnetometer to see these. And if you're going flying over an area where the igneous rock was deposited when the magnetic field was its present orientation, then what you're gonna have is a very slightly stronger magnetic field. And of course, since it's kind of alternated over time, this creates a pattern. And we actually saw this. So it actually have a stronger magnetic field right by the ridge is because this is where we're creating oceanic crust, 
present day, it's going to be the same as the present magnetic field. And so we find these sort of stripes parallel to the ridges tied to the known timing of these magnetic reversals. It suggested a pretty uniform rate of crust moving away from these ridges. And it also, we noticed that these things are symmetrical. And then the piece of evidence that really, uh, we were talking here at the beginning, somebody mentioned having a geology professor in the 1950s, didn't believe in plate tectonics yet. A lot of people didn't believe in it who all the way up to about the late 1960s. And then there was a project, uh, its acronym was JOIDES, but everybody refers to it as the Deep Sea Drilling Project. And they went and drilled a bunch of holes in the deep ocean floor. If somebody works in the oil industry, I cringe looking at the, uh, the equipment that was used for it. If they had struck a pocket of hydrocarbons in that drilling, it would have just gone into the ocean. There was no ability to contain it at all. So you know, it's one of those things that raises a big safety red flag with me when I look at how it was done. But anyway, it was done and it was done safely. And so they drilled holes in the seafloor. And of course, this is a consortium of universities. So every sample is studied by many different doctorate students, becomes part of many dissertations. And one of the things they look at are microfossils in the sediments on the seafloor. And they discovered the further you get away from the ridge, the older the seafloor is. They also discovered, okay, if we take a look at ages of rocks, most of the rocks in the United States east of the Rocky Mountains are more than 300 million years old. There's nowhere that old anywhere in the world's oceans. So the oceans were younger than the continents. And so that was really a compelling piece of evidence that kind of killed off the opposition to, uh, so continental drift, the ridiculed theory of the 1920s by the 1960s became plate tectonics as we renamed it and everybody bought into it. And so it's kind of a case study of a scientific revolution. It was a powerful idea that had multiple lines of evidence and has good strong predictive value as well as helping us reconstruct the, the past. And it was a, a unified theory that explained the distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes, origin of continents, origin of ocean basins, the genesis and destruction of mountain chains. So awful lot of what goes on in geology was pulled together in one single theory. Okay, so this is the end of my section on the history. So we're, we're up to the 1970s here, but by that time it was it become, it's almost the other way, it was a complete dogma and people were using it to explain absolutely everything. So I'll take a couple minutes here to answer any questions anybody has on the first part. So, yeah, so um, we have time for a few questions. If you want to ask a question, you can either wave your hand or uh, just uh, talk. So um, I wanted to ask about one of my questions I've never gotten a good answer to. Maybe there's a good one, I don't know is these magnetic reversals, what is it that causes these, the, the magnetic field to reverse like that? It seems like an unlikely thing to happen, but uh, I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure there's a reason too, and there's a lot of research <laughs> on it, but nobody's really come up with a good answer. And uh -huh. it's really a uh, hot topic at the moment because oh. just the last few years, the Earth's magnetic pole has been moving more rapidly than before and the field seems to be getting a little bit weaker. Mm -hmm. And so people are asking if we could be going toward a magnetic reversal. And of course, we actually don't have a very good understanding of what even causes the Earth's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. We believe it's caused by currents within this liquid iron outer core. Um, so you've got a moving conductor, uh, but we, uh, we, don't, we haven't documented those currents at all. And so we really don't have a good handle on what caused the reversals. So should we be uh, nervous about uh, a reversal coming down the pike? Uh... Uh, potentially, yes, because one of the things a magnetic field does is it blocks uh, solar storms. So that's the reason you only get auroras at very high latitudes in the northern or southern hemispheres is the uh, charged particles that, that cause the auroras are deflected up there by the Earth's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. It's believed if the field reverses that there may be a period, and remember, an instant to geologists could be a thousand years long. Yeah. And so there might be a period with little or no magnetic field, in which case we're going to get more radiation. It'd be very hard on communications. Mm. Uh, existing solar storms, if you get a big one, will uh, have major effects on, on worldwide communications. So it could be, could be pretty significant. 
could it increase the rate of mutations in uh, biological organisms? Um, could, because you would, you'd increase background radiation some. Mm -hmm. Of course, what we don't always talk about very much is that the United States, Russia, and France, with their atmospheric nuclear tests in the 1950s and early 1960s, already actually doubled the rate of background radiation in the world. Wow. It's fading slightly. So we've already done some things that increase the rate of mutations ourselves. Uh -huh. Right. Mar uh, I think Margo has a question. Uh, yes, I was looking at your uh, chart where the magnetic field and the ocean bottom were sort of, could you it's explain that a little better? Okay. Yeah. Well, of course, the argument here is that the ocean is being created at these ridges. Let me jump back a couple of slides. Yeah, so, was... well, again, this one, the ocean bottom is being created here. So either if it's being created and it's just going away like a conveyor belt, as I go further away from the ridge, it's going to get older. And as I go further back in time, I'm going to get these points where the magnetic field has reversed. And basically, I, I can treat the line, distance away from the ridge as a timeline. Say the thing opens up four centimeters a year, one side of it's going out two centimeters a year, and this is typical numbers for the North Atlantic Ocean. So that uh, period back to the first magnetic reversal is going to give me several kilometers wide here at the top, a little bit stronger magnetic field. Then on each side of that from a little earlier time period, I have rocks that cooled at the mid-ocean ridge. They were at, at the ridge when they cooled, but they cooled in a reversed direction. Because of that, it's like a little bar magnet. It's got a certain remnant magnetism of its own. It's the opposite from the Earth's magnetic field. So the combination of the two magnetic fields results in a lower magnetic field uh, over the areas where we have the reverse magnetism. And then one of these other things is we have these little short intervals we refer to as subcrons, and we tend to see these in the seafloor as well. Um, so if you, you think about it, that basically where I've got the cursor right now at the ridge is time zero in either direction is pretty much a linear as a function of time that you're getting older. Okay. And, and so basically, if, if you think of this as a time measure, these different colors as shown in the seafloor here would correspond to the scale of when we've had these normal and reversed uh, magnetic field time periods. Wow. Does that help? Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, any other? I just wanted to ask about the ring of fire. It seems like that's the one that we are, are, are more familiar with in terms of this band of uh, activity, which is at margins of the plates. But I'm just wondering, it, why is it that we're so much more familiar with the ring of fire and not so much the other places that you showed on the map? Well, the, the ring of fire is, is basically a ring of what we refer to as convergent boundaries. I already mentioned that the Atlantic Ocean is opening up. Of course, if it's opening up and you're staying the same size, some, a different ocean has to be getting smaller. It turns out it's specific. Mm -hmm. So the crust is diving underneath the continents. And when that happens, we're going to talk about the three kinds of plate boundaries in the, the next section. But when that happens, the really big earthquakes and a lot of the, the volcanic eruptions are associated with those convergent margins. Mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of earthquake epicenters associated with the mid-ocean ridges, like the map I showed earlier the mid of the earthquake epicenters, but those are very small earthquakes. They aren't the ones you read about in the newspaper with buildings collapsing and people getting injured or killed. These are, first of all, they're in the middle of the ocean. They're usually very far from land. And they're also not large enough that they would be damaging even if they were in an inhabited area. So, so the reason probably for the notoriety of the ring of fire is of our different types of plate boundaries, the convergent margins are the ones that are associated with the most dramatic natural disasters. Okay, good, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, I guess we can proceed with part two. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the whole thing works. So I have to step back, discuss the uh, our knowledge of the structure of the earth. And this was the uh, idea of crust, mantle, and core was established by the uh, 1930s. Uh, seismometers were actually developed, uh, precision seismometers were developed in the First World War to locate enemy artillery pieces. And then after the war, scientists used them and started to learn a lot about Earth structure because we have an earthquake on one side of the Earth, 
the seismic waves pass through it, we can see by things like the speed which they move, different types of seismic waves, we can tell different kinds of properties of the Earth. Our most commonly measured seismic waves are, are P waves, which are basically exactly the same as sound. So think of sound traveling through the Earth. Those can travel through solid, liquid, or gas. Uh, we also have shear waves that can only travel through the solid. That's why we know that we have a liquid iron outer core, because if there's an earthquake on one side of the world, there's a shadow zone on the other side of the world doesn't get any shear waves because they disappear into that liquid iron outer core. So the inner core wasn't discovered until later. It was a little more complicated uh, discovery, but this liquid iron core is important because it gives us our magnetic field. But the part that really of the earth that really gets involved with plate tectonics is the mantle. And the mantle is about two thirds of the volume of the earth or the mass of the earth there, but it's not all that well known. Um, it's based on a change in seismic velocities is why we decided that the, to create the boundary between the crust and the mantle. That decision was made before we understood plate tectonics where the movement went on or anything. And the crust relative to the size of the earth is quite thin. So if you take a really large like uh, Roe Beauty apple or something, the thickness of that skin relative to the size of the apple is about like the thickness of the earth's crust relative to the size of the earth. So the crust is very thin. So it turns out when we start talking about continents moving around, what's actually moving, we now refer to as the lithosphere, it's the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. And I should also say that you don't know, talk about these changes, there's a compositional issues here too. The core, both inner and outer core are made out of iron and nickel. So it's basically metallic. The mantle is mostly made out of a mineral called olivine. Those are those little sparkly green crystals you see if you look at the black lavas when you visit Hawaii. Uh, olivine is also the uh, gemstone peridot, fairly uh, low cost gemstone. And so the rock that is made up of crystals of olivine is called peridotite. And that's what makes up the mantle. So most of the earth is uh, green rock. And uh, the crust has different composition. And our, our, the continents are quite complicated. We have many kinds of rocks. But it's sort of an average composition, continents are close to granite. So granite's a light colored rock, cools from a melt. And the ocean crust is different. It's made out of basalt. It's a dark rock that cools from a melt. Looks, well, it's familiar to you if you've been to Hawaii. That's what, what the volcanoes there erupt. So, so it's a dark, fine grained rock. It's different from what the continents are made of, and it's denser. OK, so now getting to plate motion, I mentioned the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. So we have this part of solid peridotite, it's a very hard green rock. And then we have, in this case, some granite on top of the continental crust. That's moving around. It's not uniform in thickness. Where it sticks up the most is also where it sticks down the most. So it's sort of like the crust floats on the mantle that each layer essentially floats on the layer below it. So the place where the crust is thickest in the United States lower 48 is the state of Colorado which isn't, shouldn't be surprising, is the highest average elevation. The place where the crust is thickest in the entire world is the plateau of Tibet. Once again, highest average elevation. Then, then beneath the crust, like say we have this hard solid material, peridotite. People before plate tectonics thought the whole mantle was that way all the way down. But the next layer below this so-called lithosphere, and these are subdivisions of the mantle, we refer to as the asthenosphere. It turns out this is still about 98% solid crystals. And it's one or 2% liquid, but that's enough that it can behave over long periods of time like a very extremely viscous liquid. And that's where the movement takes place because obviously things have to move somewhere. We can't push these continents through, through solid material. So then let's take a look at the boundaries. When we have moving these plates around on a sphere, we have three possible boundary configurations. One is what we refer to as a divergent margin, tectonic plates moving apart. Uh, so we're creating new lithosphere right out this ridge. And because we're plating molten material on from the bottom, it gets thicker as we go away from the ridge. So it's thinnest right out the place where it's right in the middle of the ridge where it's breaking. So these are also called spreading boundaries, mid-ocean ridges, or simply ridges for short. They're sometimes referred to as constructive margins because we are creating crust there. 
Then the other one, I mentioned we talked about ring of fire, convergent margin. This is where they come together. When they're coming together, the, uh, we have this process we call subduction where plate is consumed downward into the mantle. And these are associated with volcanoes. You'll see the volcanic arc in here. These are also associated with the very largest earthquakes. If you look at the uh, largest earthquakes that have been recorded in the world in the last <clears throat> 60 or so years, you had a 1960 Chile-Argentine border one, 1964 Good Friday Alaska earthquake. Then you had the uh, 2005 uh, tsunami, the Banda Aceh earthquake in Indonesia caused the Indian Ocean tsunami. And more recently, you had the Japanese one that, the, that was associated with the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. Those are the very largest earthquakes that have been recorded in the last 70 years. Uh, those are all associated with these convergent margins. And, and those are bigger earthquakes than we are capable of having here in California. And so this process, and of course, we have to, if we're creating crust in one place, we have to destroy it somewhere else. The third type, the other possibility of how to move is the plates can move past each other. So we are neither creating nor destroying uh, crust here, which means these are sometimes called conservative margins, nothing to do with politics, but everything to do with that you're neither creating nor destroying crust. And these are sometimes called transform boundaries or transform faults. They're popular subject of discussion of geology in California because the San Andreas Fault's one of them. So going back into a little more detail in each type of boundary, divergent boundaries, most of the place we see these is what we call seafloor spreading, these mid-ocean ridges. So the ocean's pulling apart, so the two sides of the Atlantic are pulling apart. The Atlantic's a good example of this. We have magma welling up in the middle to fill the gap, and the magma cools and adds material to each side. One of the things people observe early on was that these things seem to be symmetrical. And it appears, even though it's pretty much completely passive, the reason it's symmetrical is the temperature of the cold rock on each side is the same. And so that the rate that the hot rock is, or the molten material is going to plate onto the cold rock is equal on each side of the magma chamber. And so these things spreading out symmetrically and slowly, like you say, typical number for a spreading ridge. Uh, basically each year, London and New York get about four centimeters further apart. So that's kind of a typical rate. And so when we look at these uh, mid-ocean ridges, uh, the best known one is the mid-Atlantic ridge. Uh, it snakes through the entire ocean. It outcrops at Iceland, but it goes all the way down uh, into, uh, into the Circumantarctic Ocean from there. So we're all the way down the length of both the North and South Atlantic. You've got an elevated ridge, quite a bit higher than the rest of the seafloor. Got a rift valley in the middle, about 10 kilometers wide, half a kilometer deep. Uh, all aspect of it seems to be symmetrical. And those earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are happening in that little rift valley in the middle of the ridge. And of course, I mentioned before, the age of the Earth's crust gets uh, older as we go away from the ridges. So here's a map. We're ignoring the age of the continents for the moment here, but we can take a look at the different ages of oceanic crust. So right next to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there's also one called the East Pacific Rise. You'll see it's south of North America and west of South America. That's your fastest spreading ridge. So you have a large area of relatively young ocean crust there. Our oldest ocean crust is in the Western Pacific. And of course, whenever I uh, teach a class on Earth history and have students fill out a ge blank geologic time scale and put in the name of the periods, the one period that the most students get right is Jurassic. And I guess I have Steven Spielberg to thank for that because of the movie Jurassic Park. Uh, it turns out that Jurassic is the oldest crust we find in the ocean, anywhere in the main oceans. It's it a little older in place like the Mediterranean or the Black Sea, but in the actual open oceans, the oldest is Jurassic. Yet, like I say, most of the rocks in the Eastern United States are older than that. So that's a, another sign that we're creating new ocean and that we've been doing this. And so next type of boundary, you know, I'm going to go into a little more detail of divergent boundaries. So we'll talk a little more about convergent boundaries. So at this point now, we have two plates coming together. One dives down underneath the other. The one that goes down is always oceanic crust. Continental crust is too light. It's like trying to hold down a beach ball in the swimming pool. You can't 
hold it down underwater because it's too buoyant. So continental crust will not go down, only oceanic crust goes down. And of course, this recycles oceanic lithosphere. And there's sort of a material balance issue that I'll talk about a little further along when we start talking about the, uh, the driving mechanisms here. Because when one of the things that is happening with plate tectonics has happened since the beginning of the Earth is we are gradually differentiating the Earth, putting denser material closer to the center and bringing lighter material up to the surface. So you have this, this steady differentiation, but unlike the ideas early on of seafloor spreading, the Earth does this while maintaining a constant circumference. When we look at what happens with a plate that goes down, uh, these angles vary from as shallow as 10 or 15 degrees to about 60 degrees, but they typically go down at about a 45 degree angle. And we see these earthquakes, because this is old and cold, rigid crust that's going down here, uh, it, will have, it will be rigid at greater depths than the Earth's crust would be in other areas. And so we see these uh, earthquakes, shallower earthquakes that are associated with fractures and brittle deformation of the crust. The deeper earthquakes are too deep. Uh, the, the earth becomes more ductile. So these are too deep to happen as a breaking of a big mass of rock like a shallow earthquake. And so it's actually believed that what happens in the, uh, in the subducting crust is we change certain mineral phases as we get higher pressures and temperatures. And that goes, creates a denser mineral phase, which makes it easier for the material to, to, to uh, go uh, downward into the mantle. But also these mineral transformations can occur in a pretty big volume of rock quickly. And so these are actually cause earthquakes. Uh, and so that's what we believe are the deeper earthquakes. And the earthquakes stop below about 660 kilometers depth. That is a huge depth. I talked about how deep you could get rigid breaks of earthquakes. Here in California along the San Andreas Fault, something like 15 or 20 kilometers is your deepest earthquake. So these are much deeper earthquakes that we get here. So the other thing that happens is this slab goes down. And of course, this is oceanic material going down. It contains both the type of the basaltic crust that we created at the mid-ocean ridge. It also contains a couple of miles of sediment that accumulated on it during that many millions of years from moving to the mid-ocean ridge to the subduction zone. That sediment is full of water. It's full of water, it's full of calcium carbonate, it's full of silica. It's full of a lot of different things you don't normally find in the mantle. And so somewhere at about 150 kilometers depth as that thing's going down, that water um, changes the melting points of a lot of, of minerals. So what happens is the composition of the volcanic material we get here is different from what we get at the mid-ocean ridges. Remember when I said the continents were made out of granite or other light-colored igneous rocks? Well, that's where the light-colored igneous rock comes from. My example in the plate here, I'm showing oceanic crust going underneath oceanic crust. So I got basalt on the downgoing slab, basalt on the overriding slab, but I create granite because when I melt mantle material or oceanic crust in the presence of water, I selectively melt the components that we see in granite, silica, potassium rich uh, fluids, sodium rich fluids, those selectively melt. And so I'm creating a different composition melt. And so we refer to these as continental arcs if the overriding plate is continental. Example of continental arc would be the Cascade Mountains of Oregon and Washington. And then if it's oceanic, we refer to it as an island arc. Examples of that would be Japan, Indonesia, Tonga, the Aleutian Islands, or uh, quite a number of them. So then we look at transform boundaries. You know, this block diagram of the lower right looks suspiciously like Southern California, and that's one of everybody's favorite examples. So here we have lithosphere is sliding past. It's neither created nor destroyed. These are characterized by big earthquakes. The San Francisco earthquake is one of them, but unlike our divergent or convergent boundaries, these are not characterized by volcanoes. Turns out most of our transform boundaries are in the oceans. When we look at these mid-ocean ridges, they are not a continuous divergent boundary. They're little sections of them offset by transform faults, which actually turns out to be a necessity because remember all this moving around is on a sphere. And so it turns out as we start moving these different plates, there are some geometrical considerations that happen moving around on a sphere. 
So if you actually have a junction where three boundaries come together, like the orange dot in this illustration, it can't stand still on a sphere. It could until the ground was flat. It isn't. And so, we, and this is the Indian Ocean, of course, here. And uh, so we have lots and lots of these in the oceans, and they're associated with all the different spreading edges. And we have a few examples on land, and they're, of course, particularly well thought of here in California because one of the best known examples is California's San Andreas Fault. We have a ridge system offshore Northern California and Oregon. And we also have a ridge system in the, the Sea of Cortez that exists between Baja California and mainland Mexico. And this is a long transform connecting those. And you can see there's also a so-called Mendocino triple junction, the thing with the teeth on it, the upper end of that map is a subduction zone. So we have a subduction zone in Oregon and Washington. And the aerial photo on the lower left is a photo of the San Andreas Fault on the Carrizo Plains of Southeastern San Luis Obispo County, which happens to be where I was just last week looking at this. You can see where it's offset creeks and things like that. So that's a well-known one. Two other big ones are the Anatolian Fault in Turkey and the Alpine Fault of New Zealand which has been associated with some fairly serious earthquakes last few years in the city of Christchurch. So I started to mention triple junctions. One thing is if we have three plate boundaries coming together, we have what we call a triple junction. And in the case of the first one I'm showing, which is Indian Ocean, all three boundaries are ridges. So we have three extensional boundaries. Doesn't have to be that way. Mendocino triple junction, Northern California is a right hand image here. And there we have a transform fault uh, to the south, the San Andreas Fault. We have an offshore transform fault to the west, and we have a subduction zone to the north. So you can really mix and match kind of any which way on which types of boundaries come together. Because we're on a sphere, over geologic time, a triple junction will move. And the, uh, the Mendocino triple junction, as we go further back in California history, was in the Bay Area, and we go further back yet, it was in Southern California. So, and it's progress across California explains many of the, the features we see in the state today. And so we so already started talking about moving triple junctions. So plate boundaries change over geologic time. Uh, oceanic plates, of course, we create them at the ridges. We destroy them in subduction zones. Continental plates, we never destroy, which is going to be when I talk about topics. One of the topics is that the continents are getting bigger with time. We never destroy them because we cannot subduct them. So once we have created this continental crust, it's up there at the top and it's gonna stay there, but we can split continents apart. Think about the creation of the Atlantic Ocean. We split Africa and North America off, for, I mean, South America and North America off from Africa and Europe. So we can break these continents apart at risk. We can also join them. We have continental collisions. So we talk about continental rifting. It's kind of interesting. Every geology textbook, when I've tried to evaluate textbooks for teaching geology class, when I talk about continental rifting, the example they use is the Rift Valley of East Africa, which is a good example. But I kind of ask, given that most of these textbooks are written in and sold in the United States, why they don't look at Eastern California? We have continental rifting along Highway 395. Uh, basically, think, think of uh, the, the Sea of Cortez like a big zipper. And you're just pulling it northward and gradually uh, that split of uh, Baja California off of Mexico would be California off of Nevada with time. And, and US 395 is very close to the, the right along the rift margin there. So somewhere when we're going to create an ocean, we have to start pulling a continent apart. We drop down a little keystone block and get some volcanism because we get hot material welling up from below. And all that has to happen, pull it apart before we finally start creating oceanic crust in the middle. And so this is our example of continental rifting. The other thing is plate collision. If we're consuming an ocean basin, at some point, if you look at the uh, left-hand block diagram here, I've got this oceanic crust, at some point it disappears. When it does and two continents collide, uh, they can't, one continent can't go down under the other. So this oceanic plate literally breaks off and sinks down into the mantle. And uh, we close up the ocean and we usually push up a really big mountain range. Once again, every textbook uses the same example. The Himalaya range is created by the uh, collision of India 
with, uh, with Asia. And so of course, highest mountain range in the world. But another example, you can see on this satellite image, many of you might recognize that's Italy. The Alps, Italy is actually, uh, geologically is part of Africa. Africa is moving up toward Europe. Italy was an island, but it's made out of continental crust. It hits Europe, it can't go under. So it smashes into it, pushes up the Alps, highest mountain range in Western Europe. As it does that, Africa is still moving northward. That subduction zone moved, it jumps. And now underneath, you know, people say Italy is shaped like a boot. Underneath the sole of the boot is now a subduction zone and you have volcanoes in Southern Italy. Think of Vesuvius, uh, Mount Etna, Stromboli. Okay, so that's where the present day subduction is. And so the, this plate collision pushed up the Alps in India, the subduction did not jump. There's no subduction zone off India. India is still pushing into Asia. And that might be why the mountain range is pushed up is the highest mountain range in the world. And then other question is, how fast do these things move? And of course, this is always something I uh, have fun with with the students. And basically look at all the different ones, your rates range from about one to 20 centimeters a year and typical rates about five centimeters a year. And so one of the things I try to talk to people about this rate, something in everyday life that goes about five centimeters a year, it's about the rate your fingernails grow. So you can think about it next time you trim your nails. Since the last time you trimmed your nails, New York and London got that much further apart as the length of your nail trimming there. And at first, you know, we're struggling with various methods of, of measuring the velocities. And then of course, in the mid 1980s, the uh, navigation satellites that the military had already been using for a number of years, they made this available to the public. And so that changed everything and it changes navigation when you're out in the field now. And it changed your ability to measure with the satellites, you could measure the movement of these plates. And so, you say our fastest moving one is the ridge in the south part of the eastern Pacific, spreads by at least 18 centimeters a year in places. Uh, example, real slow moving one is the Red Sea is opening up in between Arabia and Africa. That moves it a little over half a centimeter a year. And so we can get these movements now that we have satellites. Before that, when we were first coming up with the idea of plate tectonics back in the 1950s, we started thinking in terms of measuring a rate. Turns out we thought we could explain all our volcanoes with plate tectonics. There's a class of volcanoes we can't explain with plate tectonics. They're called hot spots. And these are believed to be plumes of hot material come from deep within the mantle, deeper than where the movement of plates occurs. And you can see a whole bunch of different hot spots listed on this map here. Uh, two that'd be familiar to most Americans are Yellowstone and Hawaii. Well, if we look at Hawaii, it's actually a good example of how to measure this rate, because it turns out all the islands in Hawaii were created by one volcano, essentially. Picture you've got this volcanic material coming up from beneath where the plate's moving, and the plate moves over it. So Kauai, the furthest out island of the ones you can fly to and visit today, is about 5.6 million years old. 5.6 million years ago, it was physically located where the Kilauea volcano is now. So really all the volcanoes in the Hawaiian Islands are just Kilauea, but it kept moving off of it and then punched through again. And of course, then if I've got an age and a distance, I can calculate a rate. Of course, I got a direction really easy. I just look at the direction of the line of islands there. And so you can come up with a rate, you come up with about eight centimeters a year if you use the Hawaiian ones. And of course, I, I like to use real data on that one, but that's one I often put in as a final exam question. Okay, so now I'm gonna let, my last part is gonna be newer topics, but first I'd like to stop and take a few questions about uh, aspects of plate tectonics and how it works. Okay, um, so anybody uh, got a question for Greg at this point? Uh, Margo? Um, I yeah. You know, wasn't Humboldt looking for basalt when he traveled around the world? It seemed to me, I read his biography recently, and uh, Humboldt was going all over the place looking for basalt. What was his motivation, do you think? 
Uh, I'm not sure what his motivation was. I have not read a biography of Humboldt, though I know he did travel very extensively. But the timing of his travels, if he was looking for basalt, it would be uh, more likely to be looking for economic resources because the whole idea of continental drift came much later than Humboldt. I can say that. <laughs> but, but I don't know actually enough about Humboldt and what his motivations were as to why he was looking for basalt. I think he was looking for coal. Is that possible? Uh -huh. Uh, well, it's possible, but you won't find coal with basalt because basalt is a volcanic rock and coal is found in sediments. But coal was, you know, at the time of Humboldt, so we go to the 19th century, coal was, uh, it controlled the destinies of nations in many ways. The, you had to have coal and iron to be a developed country if you read things that were written at that time period because people didn't trade like they do today. So, uh, Expeditions looking for mineral resources were probably more the rule than the exception all the way up to the, to the 20th century. What about Mount St. Helens? Now that's a volcano that went up, but it's not on your chart. Uh, not on my chart, but it's one of, we talk about plate boundaries. Remember I mentioned we have a convergent boundary in Oregon, Washington. So part of the Pacific Ocean crust is going underneath Oregon and Washington. So Mount St. Helens is one of the uh, volcanoes associated with that. That presence of moisture in the in the melt that comes up that changes the composition from basalt to granite also changes the style of eruptions. You know, when they have an eruption in Hawaii, people fly out there to spectate on the eruptions. When Mount St. Helens erupted, you had a big evacuation zone, and uh, all of the people who were killed by that were inside the evacuation zone when it erupted. But these are convergent margins are associated with extremely violent explosive volcanic eruptions that are not something you want to spectate. And Mount St. I, was living, that. I was living in Hilo when the 1960 tidal wave came through and that was the earthquake in Chile. What kind no. of an earthquake was that? Uh, that was also convergent margin. The that eastern Pacific goes underneath the west slope of South or west coast of South America. And so the entire Andes mountain range uh, contains a whole series of, of actually some of the largest volcanoes in the world, at least the largest in the world in terms of their height above sea level. Although there's a lot of non-volcanic peaks in the Andes as well, but that's convergent. Yeah, speaking of mountain peaks, um, I noted uh, we've done a lot of hiking in the Sierra Nevada and I expected that we, we would find mostly granite, but you do find uh, volcanics up there uh, quite a bit as well. And so that would tell me that uh, it wasn't a, uh, uh, the plate boundaries were not moving in a transform, transform um, direction. They must have been, there must have been some subduction going on at that time. Is, is that related to this um, moving, uh, moving convergent point that you had? Uh, it's a moving triple junction and yes, it is related. And that observation is what got all kinds of scientific awards for Dr. Tanya Atwater, oh. who is now a professor emeritus at UC Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. but was at MIT when she did her work. But she kind of figured out the whole history of California, that triple junction up by Mendocino is gradually moving northward. So if we go back, say, 35 million years to the where the Sierra Nevada are, was like Oregon and Washington. Mm -hmm. So the Sierra Nevada of 35 million years ago Think of like the Oregon Cascades, a lower range than present day, but here and there, great big volcanoes. Up at the surface, it's going to have light colored volcanic rock at depth. And this would happen if you drilled, you know, 10 miles underneath the Oregon Cascades, it's going to be granite. Mm -hmm. Now, with time, and as, they, as the triple junction moved northwards and the subduction stopped, the crust rebounded, and then the Western North America started to spread out. And this is where I said Baja is breaking off of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So you're opening like a zipper. So as it's spread out, this you, you're creating a continental rift just east of the Sierras. This is the reason for the steep east slope of the Sierras. Mm -hmm. And so if you look in the northern Sierras, in areas that are not heavily eroded, you'll see volcanic rock. And then the more heavily eroded areas, you'll see granitic rock. You go into the southern Sierras, which is really high, like the Whitney area, You'll see really light colored granite and here and then you will see dark igneous veins cutting across the granite and of course cross-cutting relations those veins cutting across have to be younger mm -hmm. and what those are as i say we're starting to have a continental rift 
There's new hot material rising up underneath the Owens Valley, hence Hot Creek at Mammoth. There's also geothermal power plants in that area. And Mammoth Mountain itself is a, is a volcano. Uh, yeah. So we have this hot material moving up, but it's different. Now it's a divergent margin. So yeah. instead of making it almost white granite, the stuff's almost black. <laughs> wow. So yeah, California, has, that'd be a whole, going into the history of California would be a good talk all in itself. It's a Very complicated complex. subject. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Joe had a question. Yeah, um, I did. Uh, why is the core made of iron? Why that metal? Uh, I guess it's really has to do with how much the abundance of these things in the universe. And when we, the main elements in the universe, so they're very rare on Earth, are hydrogen and helium. And then fusion in stars, we combine hydrogen, make helium. You can combine these things heavier and heavier. The last fusion reactions produce iron as a product. So as, as you go through these different fusion reactions, there are certain stopping points. So the reasons we have disproportionately large amounts of carbon, oxygen, silicon, and iron in the universe compared to other uh, elements of the same weight range is that those are the end products of, of extensive fusion reactions. Normal fusion will not produce heavy elements. So the fact that we have gold, copper, uranium, mercury, lead on Earth indicates that the solar system is recycled. Those were produced in uh, earlier uh, supernova events because on only a supernova will produce heavy elements. But the abundance of iron, yeah, is because it's this tail end. So it's actually recycled material from earlier generations of stars. We estimate the Earth's about four and a half billion years old. They figure the universe is at least 14 billion years old, so much older. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. William, yeah, William yeah. had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering if uh, the moon's gravitational force has any effect as a driver of uh, plate uh, movements as it does on the um, oceans of the Earth. Um, there are uh, solid Earth tides. Of course, oceans rise and fall by several feet. Uh, solid Earth does rise and fall by several inches. Uh, these probably don't have a lot to do with the driving mechanism of plate tectonics, but what they do, remember these plates are moving past each other, we're creating stress, and at some point it has to break and give us an earthquake, because these Earth tides help uh, allowing these earthquakes to happen. Basically, once we have a lot of stress, this adds a little extra stress to the system, can be a triggering mechanism for an earthquake. Okay, well, let's start um, on then. You think climate change is going to affect anything? Uh, anything, yeah, it'll probably affect a lot of things, but one thing it probably won't affect is the movement of the continents. Okay. This is going down. This is a, the pressures and temperatures that are off the spectrum of what we uh, normally work with here at the surface. And so probably not, plate tectonics is probably not greatly affected by climatic changes. Uh, one thing that is climate change influence that does change the shape of continents are ice ages. Mm -hmm. So when you have one of these big glaciations, you take off a huge amount of continental material. And in most of Earth history, you don't have them. So that in terms of where climate change affects geology, I would say glaciers would probably be the, the intersection of the two. Mm -hmm. and, and glaciers are huge geologic forces. The amount of sediment carried to the ocean by glaciers in Antarctica exceeds that carried to the ocean by all the world's rivers. So they're extraordinarily powerful agents of erosion. Mm -hmm. What about fracking? Uh, fracking is something I got called in to do talks about so much. I got kind of sick of it a few years ago, but nobody seems to want me to come around and talk about it anymore. Uh, once again, not really related to plate tectonics, there is an issue in Oklahoma uh, with induced seismicity. Uh, they do a lot of fracking in Oklahoma. The issue there is that these frack wells produce a lot of wastewater. And it turns out they inject the wastewater, dispose of it. You have to, because the wastewater contains, it's typically salty and often contains other elements. It's not something you can uh, dump in a stream or put on a crop. So you inject it deeper than aquifers that are used for drinking water. Drinking water is typically around zero to 600 foot depth. So these are injected typically maybe 5,000 foot depth. 
And some of those wells in Oklahoma, well, of course, you, you operate one of these wells, you charge people money by how much of this water you're disposing. So you have an economic incentive to pump as much water down that well as you can. And some of those were causing earthquakes. And people got excited, people blamed it initially on the fracking, but you know, they've got a bunch of good earth science departments you might expect, University of Oklahoma, University of Tulsa. They put a lot of seismometers out on the ground so they could accurately pinpoint these earthquakes. And they led right back to the injection wells, which led to some recent legislation in Oklahoma. Basically, the ones that were causing the earthquakes were injecting at a much higher rate than you're gonna be allowed to inject now. But so you, you can, not fracking itself, but the injection of the wastewater from it can cause earthquakes. Okay, are we ready to go on yeah, to yeah, part yeah, three? Part three. Okay, so now I'm going to talk, you know, we, we have this idea of this giant supercon 250 million years ago that broke up, but the Earth's four and a half billion years old. So the next question, were there earlier cycles of mm. supercontinents that broke up and came together? And we've got things worked back, oh, at least another one of these cycles back, but, you know, the further back you go, the, the sketchier the information becomes. Uh, but here's an example uh, of uh, this is early Devonian period. And I mentioned we broke up our supercontinent about 250 million years ago. Well, 400 million years ago, we're, we're assembling it. So you can see this big blob, and this is the Southern Hemisphere. And that's most of our Southern Hemisphere continents. This thing here in the middle uh, is called Laurentia. And these people have fun coming up with all the names of these things. So this was a uh, core of what's today North America. And then that blob at the top is referred to as Baltica. And that's part of what now is the Baltic part of Europe. So these things have broken apart, moved around and come back together over time. And these are, like you say, by this time, okay, we're going, we're earlier. The, the, this is actually starting to generate uh, with the ice ages and glaciations that uh, Wegener noticed. So this is when we're just pushing together everything for our uh, southern supercontinent. Pennsylvania is the last period before the Permian when the supercontinent existed. So these are some examples of uh, reconstructions of earlier plate tectonics. And the, the whole subject of Earth history with abundant life and fossils goes back about 540 million years. And we've, we've got our plate movements worked out basically through all that time period of abundant um, shelly organisms on Earth. As you go earlier in Earth history, we have less of an understanding of it. But we keep working our way back. Another topic I mentioned was origin of continents. Uh, it's pretty widely thought now that there might not have been any continents a couple of billion years ago at all. Because remember, we start out with oceanic crust. If we, um, all these things are differentiation processes. If we take mantle material, and we partially melt it and let the heavier material settle out, we end up with basalt, which makes oceanic crust. And then we take a look at their best evidence as far in the geologic past, the continents were much smaller, but we create continental crust. We're creating it even today. If you look at an example like the Marianas Islands, you have oceanic crust going underneath oceanic crust, but the composition of the islands themselves is similar to continental crust. So basically convergent margins, the volcanism associated with them, even if it's oceanic crust going under, underneath oceanic crust is creating continental crust. And once it's created, it never disappears. So the volume of the continents today is larger than what it was a few hundred million years ago. And these continents probably started out as island chains like the Marianas uh, colliding together, similar to our continental collision. And this is the, the diagram here. So we have subduction zones in between these island chains. And you know, the subduction zone that's creating one island chain can also be bringing another one into it. And it's basically repeated collisions of these island chains are what built up the continents. And so we find these little continental crust with these little sort of wedges in between of oceanic material. But one of the best places to see this is Canada because of course, in the fairly recent geologic past, huge, whoops, huge glaciers have planed off the whole upper crust of Canada and they've exposed this material. And you can see that it's basically, it's like a 
a quilt with these little belts of oceanic crust separating all these blocks of continental crust. And, and this is very old rocks, they're billions of years old, two, two billion to three billion years old. And we now believe that that's basically a whole series of little microcontinents that were gradually accreted together to make North America. So basically, continents are not original material. There might have been a little bit at the beginning. But over geologic time, we're creating more and more, which is also why we see these shallow seas a lot in earlier geologic time periods, 200, 300 million years ago. They have continental crust, but the continental crust is thin enough that they're still underneath the ocean. And that's a lot of our fossil record of marine animals comes from that. And we have hardly any of these today. In fact, some geology books I've seen try to claim there are none. I can provide two examples. One is the Persian Gulf, and other is the Arafura Sea between Australia and Papua New Guinea. But these were much more common earlier in geologic history because as the continents get bigger, they not only get bigger in area, they get thicker. So more of them is, are above the ocean. So we don't have a lot of, of shallow, warm seas like we have in the geologic past. So continents, it turns out, both formed and are not static and are gradually increasing in volume, which gets back to continental materials, the least dense of our solid components of the earth, we're bringing the lighter material up to the top. And then kind of relating to the origin of continents is the origin of life. And theories on this kind of went along parallel to the wide acceptance of plate tectonics in the uh, 1960s, 50s, and 60s. And one particularly famous experiment was the Miller-Urey experiment. Uh, Miller and Urey uh, produced, uh, they, they took a mixture of gases similar to what's believed to be the early composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So they've got ammonia, methane, water vapor, hydrogen, carbon dioxide. Uh, you notice that no free oxygen in the early Earth's atmosphere. They did some electrical discharges in this uh, and they rained some moisture through it. And then with the materials they got at the bottom, did a chemical analysis and they found some amino acids and which are some of your most basic building blocks of life are the components of proteins and things like that. There have also been some amino acids that have been found in meteorites and one. So the Miller-Urey experiment, they got an idea that the early atmosphere lightning, may, that life may have formed in, in shallow ponds on land. Of course, all our oldest fossils come from the ocean. They don't come from land. And the amino acids found in meteorites have caused some people to even theorize that life might have been spread from one planet to another, but it's, it's a grand sounding idea, but right now has no evidence at all to support it. And Miller and Urey, the main evidence to support it was this experiment where you can really produce amino acids this way. Uh, but once again, we don't have evidence that life originated on land and moved into the ocean, which is what that would suggest. And then when people were doing studies of plate tectonics, um, the uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which is associated with UC San Diego, had this deep ocean submersible called the Alvin that was capable of descending depths of many thousands of feet in the ocean. And they said, well, why don't we take a look at one of these spreading ridges? So they took the Alvin out into the Sea of Cortez and went down and looked at the spreading ridge in the Sea of Cortez. And that's how we got a whole new idea of how life may have originated. What they found at the, these, uh, right when you went right into the middle of the ridge with volcanic eruptions, there were these huge uh, hot spring type vents that they call black smokers. That's an image of one on the lower right in this slide. And these black smokers, it's basically a hot spring. And the reason it's got a little conical, uh, it's like almost sleeve that it's coming out of is those are minerals that are precipitating out of the hot spring waters as it comes out into the ocean. And it turns out these vents, subsea vents were full of living things. And so I took some samples back, they were different instead of getting their energy from eating other things like carnivores or from photosynthesis like plants, these are what we call chemosynthetic organisms. They get their energy from chemical reactions from the chemicals they're in. These are the most primitive uh, living things known. They're referred to as archaebacteria. And this might have been how life formed on Earth. It may have formed around these deep ocean vents. Important consideration, we talk about radiation, ozone layer hadn't formed yet. The sun was hotter, you have very intense ultraviolet radiation. You can have to ask some hard questions whether life could have even survived in shallow ponds on land at that time. And these vents also contain 
a lot of the element phosphorus, which is essential for life, and they contain clay minerals. And uh, some biologists think that the structures of very basic RNA life forms happen because they plated themselves onto crystals, microscopic crystals of clay minerals. So the presence of clays and phosphorus is a plus. In terms of how these vents work, basically we've got this oceanic crust pulling apart. We've got ocean water going down into fractures, getting close to this hot magma body, getting heated and rising back up. And enormous amounts of heat are transferred this way. So these are also uh, uh, important concept from uh, geothermal power plants. People are talking about putting them in the Sea of Cortez. But getting back to the origin of life, so you, your two main competing theories for origin of life now, one is that it originated at these deep ocean ridges with archaebacteria that somehow mutated into the uh, eubacteria photosynthetic organisms that spread out into the oceans. Uh, the other is, like I say, the Miller-Urey-based one that it formed in shallow ponds on land. This tends to be the more popular one now. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen it, you know, when talking about Earth's the origin of life is so far back. We now think it was very early in Earth history, maybe 4 billion years ago. So we really don't have a lot of evidence on it. But this is our strongest uh, argument of how it could have happened. Okay. And just mentioned reasons for this. We've got organic compounds readily dissolved in the warm water. I already mentioned the phosphorus, uh, also certain metals that the same metals like that you see when you go to the nutrition store and they've got zinc tablets and things like this. You kind of have to ask, why does, do, does life need all of these obscure metals? Well, may, these are all present at these hot springs where life may have formed. So that might be one explanation. Another topic is the driving mechanism. And now this was, of course, a big objection to initially to the theory of plate tectonics. Uh, people say you can't push this, this thing through here. And so, but if the asthenosphere itself moves, you're going to have, by convection, you're going to have a little bit of a drag on the base of the plate. And so that's along a big area. A ridge, you can't really push it from the ridge because at the ridge is where the crust is thinnest. So we can't really push it edgewise, but the ridge is higher. And so we can at least make an argument while well, the crust is going to try to work its way downhill. And then when we look at subduction zones, we have a lot stronger argument for a driving mechanism because when we uh, go into the subduction zone, that oceanic crust goes through those mineral changes. As it gets into the deeper part, it's denser than the surrounding mantle material. The lighter material got removed by that same volcanism that creates continental crust. So we took the lighter material out, brought it up to the surface. The downgoing slab is now heavier than the surrounding mantle, just keeps going down. And as it does that, it kind of has to, the uh, plate fragments uh, or the, the oceanic plate has to keep following it. You're not going to create a hole there. And so it, one of the things people did was look at how well do these things persist over time. Turns out convergent margins stay in one place over geologic time for long periods of time, whereas ridges actually jump around. So that also makes it look like the ridges are more passive and the convergent margins of the driving mechanism. And then people tried, well, what happens if you just do this? This will sum all the torques around all these plate boundaries. And that also tends to drive you towards the uh, subduction zones being an important part of the driving mechanism. The thing about the, uh, the problem with that, though, is so how do you create the Atlantic Ocean? You've got no subduction zone between New York and London. It's just gradually getting wider. And the only plate boundary between there is in the middle. So why did it decide to open up? So while the subduction zones as a driving mechanism are a nice argument, it doesn't necessarily explain uh, certain areas. And recent research on the Atlantic has suggested this drag on the base of the plate is an important factor there. Uh, another thing, my last bullet on this slide, says so broken plate segments. Remember when I said if we uh, stop, if for a continental collision, we stop subduction, or in the case of California, as that triple junction moved northward, so we no longer had subduction in California, that slab that was going down is still underneath there. It keeps going down. And mantle moves around it and sort of engulfs it, those movements also have effects. And that might be part of the factor of why we see this rifting in Eastern California today. So the driving mechanism is, like I say, was one of the original objections by allowing for movement in the asthenosphere. We can now at least argue that it's physically possible, but we're still having some trouble explaining 
why we observe the pattern of plate boundaries that we do. And then the last point was, so what happens to all these subducted plates? Um, these things keep going down past the earthquake limit. Once they're past the earthquake limit, we don't have a good way of telling what happens to them. But because they're denser, they have a little faster seismic velocity than the surrounding mantle. So now with enough earthquakes and enough recording points, you can do like tomography of the Earth's mantle. So basically, as we gradually gather more and more data, we develop a more detailed velocity model of the mantle. And so now we're working on that part of the mantle, the, the deeper mantle below the asthenosphere. And they believe they can find uh, higher vo seismic velocity zones associated with these remnants of these subducted plates. So it may be that we can prove up some of our theories about what's happened in the past by finding the remnants of it in the lower mantle still, hence the plate graveyard comment. Anyway, that's the last of my research topics, but I'd be, be happy to, and of course, any one of these topics could be a whole presentation in itself. All right. Well, very good. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, that's a lot of stuff to take in all at once, and uh, <laughs> we're doing our best. Uh, questions out there uh, for Greg? Well, one thing uh, I wanted to mention is that our, our talk uh, next month is going to be about asteroids. Um, and uh, we have a uh, scientist from uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center and uh, named Gerald McKeegan. He's going to talk about asteroids. And I think one of the things we might want to ask him is about this idea of uh, uh, moving amino acids around from uh, one part of the uh, galaxy to another. Um, so I'll be curious to hear what he's got to say. Uh, but uh, Greg, it did sound like you're a little skeptical about that idea. Well, normally, and of course, anytime we deal with something like this, we have almost complete absence of information. Uh -huh. And the absence of information, we usually go with the simplest model. Mm -hmm. That's not a simple model. Now, I yeah. admit the presence of amino acids. Now there's a lot of work going on on Mars. And of course, one of, one of the arguments, because Mars is colder and further from the sun it, and apparently had oceans in its history, it may have gone through similar evolutions to the Earth, but in an earlier time period. Mm -hmm. So people are arguing that life could have been transported from another body, tend to argue that it was transported from Mars. But unless we find some, at least some microfossils on Mars, it's kind of hard to argue that. Now, if you do find evidence of, of fossil, even microscopic fossils on Mars, then that theory will get more popular and people will do a lot more work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I have another dumb question. Another dumb question. Does the rotation of the earth have anything to do with the movement of the tectonic plates? Uh, probably very little, but it's getting back to the comment about the moon's uh, gravity. You know, I talked about these tides. One of the things that, that tidal forces do is they slow down the rotation of the earth. So you go back, say, 400 million years, there were probably 380 days in a year instead of 365. Because that the movement, both the solid tides and, and moving the ocean around is, is a dragging force. And so it gradually slows the earth's rotation. And in the process of doing so, it pushes the moon further away. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we uh, wrap this one up? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Um, very, very interesting uh, show of hands here. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah. And uh, do try to tune in next time for Asteroids. That'll be the second Wednesday okay. in um, April. Okay. So good to see everybody. And uh, stay safe. We're going to end the meeting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.